And we are back for another episode of the Emissary Authors Podcast, where we help faith-driven founders tell the stories that matter. My name is Paul Edwards and my co-host, Jason Todd. Great to be back on the podcast with you, my friend. How are you? I'm very well. I'm looking forward to today. There's always a, uh, a new perspective that I think we can gain from the authors that we have on the podcast. And after doing so many episodes, the broad range of people that we have spoken with has just been fascinating. It keeps me on my toes because I get to learn so much. And, and today we're talking about hope. And our, our author today, Chet, he wrote, hope is the key living through God's superpower. And he's going to define hope for us here in just a second. But one of the things that he talks about, and I'd like people to kind of listen for is this idea of, you know, he talks about this idea of gas tank and you know, when you're get, when your car is going to run out of gas, you keep an eye, you keep an eye on that gas tank. And depending on, uh, you know, your travels, you might keep more gas in that tank or less gas in that tank. And he talks about making sure that you keep an eye on the, on your hope tank. Do you know the level of your hope tank? And if you don't, what are you doing about it? And, uh, so we're, we're, we're happy to hear. Welcome, uh, Chet Kledkowski on to the Emissary Authors Podcast. Good morning, Chet. Hi, thank you so much. It's a, it's a real honor to be with you and, uh, your podcast viewers. Thank you for having me. Well, we're excited, to, we're excited to chat with you today, uh, as promised. The one of the, we're going to get right to it. Uh, Paul brought up a great, uh, question just a bit ago. It's like, how do we define hope? And I wonder in your experience and through your book, how do you define hope and how, how have you come to that uh, definition? Well, hope is one of those funny words, not funny, ha ha, funny, strange. Everybody knows the word hope. Even I who got solid D minuses in spelling could spell hope, but it, you look at it and you say, well, I know what hope is. And you turn to the next person and says, well, my hope is different. So much of what we have today is what I will call candy, cotton candy hope. It's full of air. It's very sweet. You put it in your mouth and then it's gone. Mm -hmm. It doesn't really do anything doesn't provide you with any strength. The kind of hope that God wants us to have is a hope that's as solid as the concrete underneath your feet. Hmm. You know, it's different when I'm walking. I live in central Florida. We have nothing but sand and the sand mushes and squishes and goes all over the place. But I'm here in my office and I'm on a concrete slab. This thing isn't going anywhere. And that's the kind of hope God wants for you and for me. And that hope is like, I'm going to use an analogy of sailing on a ship or driving in a car. They both have the three same dimensions. I look in the rear view mirror. I look out the back window and that's the past. And if I may describe the past, the past is the truth. What are the things that I truly believe? What are the rock solid things that I know to be true? And you think about the gospel and what is gospel? Good news. When is news? News is always in the past. News is always behind us. It's in the past. That's why it's so solid. That's why the truth of Jesus Christ doesn't move all over the place. He wasn't it. He was a historical person, fully God, fully man, came, lived, died for our sins, for the once and for all price for all of our sins, past, present, and future, rose from the dead. Now that is the solid truth. That doesn't change. Now with that is what's helped my rear view mirror or behind me in the wake of my boat, where I am right now, that is faith. That is, how is what's in the rear impacting where I am right here, right now? How I take my next step, my next action, my next call? How do I interact with a person? I have a, I'm working with someone. His name is uh, Mohammed. He's from the put, he lives in the Punjab of Pakistan. He doesn't know what to make of me. Okay. We obviously are different cultures, different time zones. 
But he he just comes out and says, I just love the way you treat me. You treat me like family. And I told him, I said, I treat you this way because you were made by God. You were made in the image of God. And I believe Jesus Christ died for you and for all your sins. That makes you somebody incredibly valuable. And I should treat you with respect. I should give you the compliment of paying attention and listening carefully. So the truth leads us into faith. But what about the future? Where is the rudder of the boat headed? Where is our steering wheel pointing us? That's where hope comes in. Hope is always the direction of the future. Hope is the future tense. What is my goal? What is my destination? And if my destination is getting yanked all around by the latest fad on one of the social media sites or by the latest episode in the news, My hope is I'm going to get whiplashed. I'm going to get hope whiplash. I'm going to be pulled here, pulled here. But God says you have a purpose and that he has a plan for you. And that gives us, some people use uh, the words true north. My true north is the hope that points me in the direction and I'm willing to walk and work towards that. You talked about the car and and the hope tank. Last time I checked, I I have a Tesla. I'm sorry. You know, I have a Tesla. I'm very happy with it. But I got to watch the gauges. It does not automatically pull itself into a supercharger and attach itself. No, I have to cooperate with it and put it in and leave it in for the right amount of time. That means I have to choose hope. I'm going to say that again. We have to choose to hope. God is a gentleman. God will never beat us over the head and and force feed us with hope. He is, I always love this picture of God where Jesus says, what? In Revelation, I stand at the door and knock, right? Wow, what patience. He's standing at the door. He's not running. He comes. And he purposefully stays there. He then purposefully knocks, but he just doesn't knock once. He knocks and he knocks and he knocks and he knocks until we open the door. We have a responsibility and we receive, when we receive Christ, we are getting, we're giving up all the junk in our trunk and we're also giving away our own good works because I don't know about you. But I have a past that says, let me see, I want God to like me. So I've got this list here. Let me get out my list of things that if I do these things, God's going to say, oh, Chet's a nice guy. And then what I'm, he's, that's going to offset the balance of all the crap I've done. Are you allowed to say crap on your podcast? Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, you're right. Okay. You um, won't you offend know, us. You might, you might offend our listeners. But well, if I offend anyone, dial 1-800-CHESTER. And I'm correct. Correct. Yeah. <laughs> leave a message. <laughs> yeah, leave a But that's not grace. Hope says, I'm going to give him everything, all of the bad stuff. But I'm also giving him everything I think is good. Because what are, what are we told the truth is? What is our good works like? filthy rags. So my good works, my filthy rags and my bad stuff. And let me tell you, I got a lot of bad stuff, but let's move on. God says, I receive, you receive my forgiveness and I change the trajectory of your life. And that's where the hope comes in for the future. So let's, let's pause here and, and pick up the story just before this book. Okay. Why? Why is hope such a big deal to you? And why now? Why this book? Why now? Okay. I'd like to give you a two part, two part answer, if I may. The first part, every, all of us, you know, you guys, Jason, Paul, everybody who's listening in the sound of my voice, we all have a hope legacy. Somewhere back in our past, there was a moment 
there was a moment where I said, we sort of came to ourselves and said, ah, I now know what hope is. That's our hope legacy. My hope legacy comes as a kid growing up in Baltimore, probably around 11 or 12. I'm laying on the floor of our house with my dad in his recliner and his favorite cold beverage in his hand. And we're watching the Baltimore Orioles play against the hated, did I say hated? Hated New York Yankees. And of, and of course, this is when dinosaurs still roam the earth. We got three channels in black and white. And so we're, we're sitting there. And of course, the hated Yankees go out for a lead. Okay. And we're all crying. We're moaning, whatever, complaining. But then the Orioles started to come back. They get one run. They get another run and the crowd is going nuts and I'm going nuts, screaming and yelling because as we all know, everybody listening is an intelligent human being. We all know that if I yell at the television, that somehow affects the game. Works so I'm yelling and screaming at the game, going nuts. And then uh, as the Orioles are hitting closer and closer, the manager of the Yankees comes out, calls timeout. And... The place is going nuts, everything, and I'm screaming and yelling, jumping up and down. And I turn to look at my dad. He hasn't said boo. He hasn't said a word. He's just sitting in his chair drinking his cold beverage. And I say, and I go, I say, Dad, what's wrong? Don't you want the, our, our Orioles to win? You know, don't we want to beat the hated Yankees? What's wrong? Why aren't you yelling and screaming and cheering? He took a, a long drink from his cold beverage. He looked at me in the eyes that I still see these many years out later. And he said the words that put the stake down for my hope legacy. He said, I don't hope because I don't want to be disappointed. Mm. Let me say that again. I don't want to hope because I don't want to be disappointed. And from that point on in my young life, I thought this, he's my dad. That's what hope must be. So I, you know, I steeled myself. I built up the walls to insulate myself from being disappointed. And that, that is where I, my hope legacy started a few years later in a very spiritual place. Now I know what you're th You're thinking to yourself. I know what a spiritual place looks like. It's a church, it's a cathedral. It's out in a beautiful, you know, uh, scenery. You're on a mountaintop. This was in a bowling alley parking lot in Baltimore. And Mike comes to me and says the most outrageous thing. I, I am yelling and screaming about how my life is a mistake. Everything's wrong. Somebody else is to blame for everything and every problem in my life. And Mike, is shaking, visibly shaking. And he says, Chad, do you know that God loves you? I'm not going to try to repeat because you all are nice people, what I said. But I just refused it. Yeah. I grew up in a church and I'm sure they said the words. I didn't hear it. That was the first time I heard the idea that I was loved by God. And through a series of events that wound up changing the trajectory of my life in yet another beautiful spiritual setting on our knees in the boiler room of a church, I knelt down and I was told I'm a sinner. I said, I got that. And that Jesus died for me. Okay. Yeah. No, I, I get that. And he's, and he said, and you could have your sins forgiven. I said, I need that. He said, and what you do is receive his forgiveness. I leaned in and I looked him in the eye and said, you have got the kitty. No, it's what I got to do. And they say, that's the beauty of it. And we'll get on our knees with tears for the first time I knew I was forgiven. I received Jesus Christ. Yeah. That's, that is the preamble. <laughs> Where this book started was in the joyful days of the pandemic, my wife and I had uh, all four of our parents alive and they were in their 90s, all four in their 90s living in Baltimore and we're in Central Florida. 
So we went, you know, they were locked in. They couldn't do anything. So we went to help them. Living in the basement of my mother-in-law's house, uh, you know, it is not quite the Ritz. It's not quite top of the mark. Yeah. First of all, there are no windows. Every day I began and ended the day in the dark. And it was at that time, you know, going out, trying to find toilet paper at four in the morning, going to five different stores, seeing the people and their angst and their agony and their hopelessness. It hit me. Everyone's without hope. And so I started blogging on hope. And that's, that was the genesis of this book. Mm. Hope is the key, living through God's superpower. This is the second time in probably Rudy days, maybe even less, that someone has recounted a story of them not understanding or feeling that they were forgiven to then the assurance, just an assurance that they were forgiven. They finally knew they were forgiven. How do you address that in your, that moment or that feeling in your book about hope? Well, I'm, I'm going to address the feeling by ignoring the feeling. How's that? If it, if you run your life, if you make your decisions based on feelings, be prepared to be disappointed, to have a screwed up life. Because what are our feelings? They get pulled one way or the other. You know, God's desire for us is, what does it say? Not to be tossed about by every wind of doctrine or the way the raging seas. We are told that God wants us to know, to know to have the rock solid evidence that Jesus died for me, all of that done with. And, and let me tell you, for anyone out there who is like me, uh, I get those feelings that come back and they come back with a vengeance. It's like a tsunami just wants to just roll me over in the, in the surf. And it says, no, you're too screwed up. You're too selfish. Why would God do anything for you? You know, you're not worthy. Does any of this resonate to anybody? And so what I've got to do, I have a responsibility rather than wallow in that is to say, thought, you come with me. And I take them into worship. I say, God, I have these feelings of the past and the past is true, but you knew this when Jesus went on the cross. Jesus knew this when he was hanging on the cross. And it says that Jesus stayed on the cross until he could say it was finished. It is done. And it's at that moment that all sin was paid for. And I have received it. So I want to thank you, God, for forgiving my sins. You knew it all ahead of time. And yet, and yet you still died for me. That's love, and that helps me set the course to say I'm going to choose hope. I was thinking, Chet, of this, uh, one of my favorite things I've ever learned from uh, Dallas Willard, the author, about hope. And he said, um, if you truly believe the gospel, meaning, you know, the Jesus is who he says he is, and he said what he meant, and he meant what he said. And you're determined to follow down, follow him down that path. Then sooner or later, you come to a place where you, you realize that amidst the destruction and wreckage and carnage and pain and suffering and sorrow and hatred and bigotry and all this, all this stuff that we're you know, if we're not careful, we're breathing in from the news all the time. You, 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 you come to a place where you realize this world is a perfectly safe place to be where you can let, you can literally say that and believe it and act as, you know, as though it's completely true in every sense of the word, even when it doesn't appear completely true in every sense of the word. That is, a, that is a great way to express it. Thank you very much for that, Paul. What I would, what I, I think in pictures, 
And so when I think of that, I think of Psalm 139. And Psalm 139 doesn't say that God's just in front of me, doesn't say that God's just behind me, doesn't say that God's to my right or my left. It doesn't say that he encircles me. It says that he envelopes me. Hmm. We are like the hamster in the ball, okay? There is no way we've been placed in there by what who God is and what he has done, and we've been sealed by his Holy Spirit, and we are encircled, we're ensphered. And nothing, what does this say? Neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth. Nothing in all of creation will able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Hmm. So with that assurance, and these things don't happen uh, automatically. No. Sometimes they do. When I became a Christian, I know your guys, your guys are going to shake your head and yell, no. When I came to Christ, I had a mouth that was just very creative. Okay. Uh, I, I, I learned, I made up new swear words. And yet, for some strange reason, which only God knows, maybe he thought I needed the assurance. That went away. That just evaporated. Mm -hmm. But let me tell you, there were other things, beliefs, Sin, did I say sins? I'll say sin that I struggled with yeah. for years and still struggle with. But it's the fact that it's, it's, we were saved by faith. That's the past, right? We're being saved right now. That's just, you know, that's our, our, our justification, our walk. And then there's the future, which is the glorification where when we meet him in the air, we'll be made totally new. Mm. I love that you bring up Psalm 139 and the idea of, you know, God hems us in, uh, because Paul and I are actually having a discussion yesterday regarding, uh, some messages I've been seeing and I just like listening to what's in the wind, uh, <laughs> you know, in, in, from various churches that I am in somehow connected, listening to some of these sermons. And there's one about pursuing the presence of God, kind of pursue his presence, pursue, 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 pursue. And, uh, without defining what the presence of God is for one or how you'd know when you're in it, um, or what happens if you're not, because mm -hmm. if we have to pursue it, then I must not be in it right now. I don't know, but there's without any of that definition, it's like this idea, this pursuit of the feeling. That's all I can estimate. It's gotta be a pursuit of a feeling that we must know somehow we're in his presence because then when you compare that with scripture, right, David says, where can I go? Yeah. Where could I go? I can't go to the highest of the mountains. I can't go into the depths of Sheol. I can't go to the darkness. Darkness is as light to you. I can't. If I were to try to flee from you, I still can't get away. Your presence is everywhere. And because of that, then when it ends, hey, search me, oh God, know me. Know my heart. Know my anxious thoughts. God, you, you, can't, you can't ask for that from a God who doesn't already surround you inside, outside, it must begin with the assurance that God is already here and available. Like, mm -hmm. like you talk about standing at the door and knocking, mm -hmm. I'm here, you got to open the door, but I'm here and I'll, and if you're trying to sneak out the back, just know, I know you're sneaking out the back. Like I'm, I'm, ever, I'm surrounded you. Therefore you can hope. Without right. that, without that, the, the, the assurance of he's already, he's already with us. There is no hope because then, then it's up to me to pursue. And like you talk about, if it's up to me to pursue, there are days I can't put on the same socks. Like, why would you trust me with the hope of my own salvation? <laughs> you know? And I mean, we, we live in a culture that is, uh, in the song hooked on a feeling, you know, what's the latest What's the latest bad, the latest feeling and feelings are an opiate. Oh, the, you always got to get higher and more. And it is, it is an empty promise. That's where, you know, the, the, the truth of the gospel, the good news, you know, 
you know, it doesn't change. It doesn't change the facts. And that's how I can have hope because the ground underneath of me isn't shifting on where, what is true. It keeps moving around. It's, it's truth. And faith is, I can take a step towards the, the direction, the trajectory that God has for me. And it takes work. Hope is not something that you just sort of say, well, it's an energy drink. I'll drink it and I'm done. No, it takes hard work. You know, I, I'm about to leave here after this podcast and I'm very excited. I'm very excited. I'm going to go to uh, my orthopedic surgeon and we're going to have a very serious talk about knee replacement. I've already had my both hips replaced and the idea of replacing my knee just makes me giggle with anticipation. Um, yes. I'm th- I just moved my knee and it clicked. I hope to sound it. So, you know, it's when the, the surgery is good, the yeah. surgery is good. But let me tell you, it takes work yeah. and pain. It, there's going to come, if anybody here has ever had that kind of orthopedic surgery, there is a moment somewhere between the time you come out of surgery and you become awake. And sometime within the first 10 days, you're going to look at yourself in the mirror and you're going to say, what in the world did I do to myself? But the good news is you're going to get better. The underlying problem was fixed. And now, yes, physical therapy is hard, but it's headed in the right direction. And that's where hope is not easy. I'm sorry. I apologize. I wish I could say, you know, it's a cakewalk, but it's not. Hope is not for the faint of heart. Hope is for the people who want to stop having their lives being jerked around and say, I need a path and hope. And it's hope is God's superpower for living that way in the 21st century. All right. Well, then, then let's. Uh, let's transition then using, using that statement there, you know, we, <clears throat> I think there's probably two types of listeners we have on this podcast. Uh, one is somebody who already knows what you're talking about, mm-hmm. clued in like probably Paul, like me, we know, of, we know of, you know, close friends who we listen to this podcast and they're, you know, they know what we're talking about, but then there's probably people who are a bit on the outside and feel a bit on the outside. What, what are you talking about? And what I'd like to maybe dig in for a couple of minutes is this idea of, we talked about feelings, we've talked about hope, we've talked about, I want to add in this idea of thinking, because if it's not a process of feeling, it's not that feelings aren't useful, feelings are useful, right? Like it's an awful time to have a relationship. If you don't have any feelings, you won't have a relationship for very long. And if you do, it's going to be a rocky one. Then if you have, if you have, uh, thinking tied in with this whole thing, Feelings, thinking, hope, walk us through what's for a person who's on kind of on the outside. I mean, this is your, this is your book. You're the expert on this, uh, at least for your own life. What do you say to those folks who are sitting on the outside, connect us to feelings, hope and thinking? Well, let me tell you what a definition of expert is, right? In a mathematical formula, X is the unknown quantity. And spurts are small streams of water. So I'm an unknown quantity of streams of water. Thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, (laughs) But trying to, for, for, and this book is really written for people just like you described. I call them fringies. They're people who are on the fringe. It's not, yeah, it's a good thing for people who have, you know, had a long-term relationship with God through Jesus Christ. It's good stuff. Something you can share with your neighbor, your friends, total strangers. That was a cue to buy the book, by the way. Uh, but so, it's in the corner. <laughs> yeah. So how do you do this? It, it works like this. The truth is, has got to be the engine that drives our lives. Because if it doesn't, 
we will go from pillar to post. Our lives will have no depth. And, and this is exactly what we have today. I don't like the car. Get rid of it. Get a newer model. I don't like the house. Get a newer model. I don't like the relationship. Get another model. You know, it's this, this churn because of things that are unsettled. When God said that he loved us, he wants nothing but the best for us. That's what love means. Love is not a feeling. God's kind of love is a love that says, I want nothing but the best for you. Now, that doesn't mean it always feels good. It doesn't mean that at all. But what it means is that it is headed towards some place. I once got a call from a doctor. And it was at 7.30 in the morning. Don't you love those calls from doctors at 7.30 in the morning? And he said, we have found a melanoma on your arm. I was like, okay, I can't spell that. What does that mean? And he went on to explain it in very uncertain term. Yeah, it was, this is serious. And we made a plan. Was I scared? Sure. Was I uncertain? Yes. But I had a relationship with someone who I had known for years, and I knew they were giving me solid advice, and they were going to walk through it with me. And that's God's love for us. So if you're on the outside looking in, I'm like, boy, I'm glad you're there. Come and look. Come and see. Come and join us because you're welcome. And God welcomes you with open arms. My dad had been away from anything having to do with religion and faith and church for many, many years for reasons that I time will not allow us to go into. But one day he had been, he had been worked on. Let's put it that way by my mom and some relatives. Why don't you come back? You know, it's like, no, nah, no. Nah. So he, he finally said, okay, I'm going back. I'm going to show them. And he went back and he went back to his church and he grabbed the pastor at the end of the sermon, at the end of the service and said, you see, I haven't been here for over 30 years and you're going to now tell me what a terrible person I am. You're going to put me down. You're going to tell me what a sinner I am. And you're just going to dump guilt all over me, aren't you? You know what the pastor did? He reached out his hand, shook my dad's hand, and said, welcome home. That's the way God re wants to receive all of us. If you're on the outside looking, in, that's the way God wants to reach out to you. That's the way he's reached out to me. And he, des he so desperately wants to reach out to you that he moved heaven and earth and came to earth to make that possible. Is that helpful? Yeah. yeah. I think there's one other thing that you, you is sort of bubbling up for me there, Shet, what you're talking about, which is that um, right. the further away, I've noticed this in my own life, I was raised in a secular home that was not, was loving, but was not, uh, driven by faith. And I've noticed it among people I know who reject the faith. Mm -hmm. And that is, um, they start to look at things, including their own lives and their decisions and their outcomes and all that sort of stuff, very myopically, meaning just through their own eyes and they don't really trust other people to help them help give them a little feedback that's a little bit less biased mm -hmm. a little more objective that has you know has visibility that they don't have because they're in the middle of it and um there's a lot of hope to be found by simply letting another person look at the same thing you're looking at that is certainly true. And if I were to meet someone like that, I would gently and humbly 
and with respect say, may I ask you a question? They, uh, hopefully they would say yes. And I would say, have you ever been out to a restaurant to eat? Have you? And, and the answer um, is always going to be yes. I say, did you know the chef? Did you know where they bought the food from? Do you know where it was sourced? Do you know whether the dishes were washed and you know, sanitized? What is the water clean or did you just put it into your mouth? I say, we accept, we are all people of faith. We are faith-based people. No one lives life on their own. Yeah. We, you know, we're, we're talking today on this marvelous technology that somebody else put together. Yep. So we are all connected to other people. So I would say with respect, you went to a restaurant, right? You were willing to trust somebody else. I look at my life and I say, do I have all of my stuff together? Mm. The answer is no. Do I know anybody who has all of their stuff together? The answer is no. We all need that voice, that help, that friendship, that companionship, that love that comes from someone else. Mm -hmm. And that extends beyond this life into our, our, we are also spiritual creatures. We all live based on faith of things. We all live on things based on things we can't see. Just as the re in, we didn't see the chef, but we live based on it. Yeah. So wouldn't you be willing to receive the idea that there's a loving God who has nothing but your best in line for you? Has nothing. He loves you so much that he was willing to give so very much just for you. Yeah. And the other, sorry, Jason, you had something you wanted to no, say. No, go ahead. I was just going to remind our viewers and listeners where they can pick up the book. The, the uh, address is on the screen. It's chetglad.org, C-H-E-T-G-L-A-D.org. Uh, lots of resources there. You've got audio files and books, of the Bible and all sorts of stuff, a wealth, actually an unexpected wealth of uh, a lot of, a lot of output. <laughs> I mean, you, you, uh, you're being, he's being very nice. Uh, Paul and saying, I, I talk too much. I didn't say that. <laughs> well, I was, <laughs> I know you didn't say it. I didn't say it cause I didn't mean it, but the, you do, you have, you've put a lot, uh, a lot of audio files out there. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and, and that goes back to where I came from. Remember you know, the story I told about the bowling alley and the, and the, uh, the boiler room. You don't know me. Okay. You don't, you just see the, you know, this image flickering on the screen in front of you. And I look fairly presentable, uh, but let me tell you, I've got a past. Mm -hmm. I've got a past and you, you heard my hope legacy. If anything, I can be a friend. I, you know, you, you can't hurt me because I have hurt myself so much. And that's why Jesus means so much to me mm -hmm. because he saw all of the junk in my trunk. He saw everything. And what did he do? He still set his face and went to Jerusalem. He went to the place he knew he was going to be arrested. He knew a good friend was going to betray him. He knew that he was going to be shackled. He knew he was going to go through all these false trials. He was going to be whipped, scourged, and then eventually crucified, dying of asphyxiation because he had just gotten so tired he couldn't lift it himself up to breathe. And yet he did that as the price for me. To me, that's good news. I had been trying to work my way to God for a long, 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 long time. And I 
I, I, rem- I have this scene in my head. I remember one time I went to the church I was raised in. I went there to take care of a spiritual matter. I did everything they told me to do. Okay. I, I got my check mark. I did this, this, and this. I did it all. And I'm walking back from doing it. And the thought pops in my head. That didn't take. That didn't work. Because it was based on what I had done or what I tried to do. It was only in the realization that God had to do it for me. that true freedom came, came through. Good stuff. Well, we're nearing the end of our time here on this podcast episode. I love, uh, I, there's so much to dig into, uh, with you, your wealth of a wealth of stories and clearly a lot of wisdom behind it. Um, Paul. You want to, uh, you want to wrap this up and yeah, I, um, I, I'm inspired by this shit. And I think, um, just to one final comment I want to tack on to that is that, um, my own experience has been that hope gets richer, the better you job, a better of a job you do of remembering who you are. And you've done that not only through this book, but also through the a treasure trove of content that you've prepared for people. You've written it down. You've done the reps. You've recorded the thoughts. You've made them available for others. And um, my experience lines up with that. It's that the more you, the more reps you put in, remembering who you are and where you've come from, and remembering that wake of truth that you've left, that that lies behind you, the the bigger of a reservoir of hope you have to conquer the path in front of you. And I had boys had a really good, um, uh, we are about to embark on a new part of time a life. We're about to, we're leaving a time of hopelessness and we are about to embark on the time where we all have purpose and meaning of life. And that's because football is back. And so, <laughs> yeah. When we're all going to watch our favorite teams, our favorite games, whatever. And you know what's going to happen? A quarterback's going to walk on the field. Now, the quarterback or any of the players who walk on the field, they weren't up in the stands and they were scratching their You know what? I'd like to play. I think I'll just go down there. No. How did they get there? Through the repetition, through the practice, by letting somebody help them. Coaches, all sorts of things. Professional golfers, you know, 800 to 1,000 balls a day. So they walk out and they call a play. And then, miracle of miracles, somebody makes a mistake. Somebody yeah. misses a tackle. Somebody drops the ball. The quarterback throws an interception, right? They walk off the field. Do they get fired? No. They sit down with someone and they go over it. Mm-hmm. What did happen? Let's walk through it. And then we walk back out on the field again. Tom Brady once said that one of the greatest skills he developed didn't have to do with his legs, didn't have to do with his arm or his hands or his footwork. It was the ability to forget. Yeah. You throw an interception. If you got that one, wait. Like, in that in your head next time you throw out no we're like that our past is totally forgiven and we can walk out on the field again with hope yeah well uh, on that note (laughs) fall on that i'm on that note i'm supposed to close but great great finish there shed and that is uh the essence of Shet's book, Hope is the Key, Living Through God's Superpower, available on Amazon, Barnes and Noble, and wherever else fine books are sold. Uh, Shet, it's been a pleasure having you with us on the Emissary Authors Podcast. I'd like to have you back again sometime soon, but in the meantime, I'm Paul Edwards. My co-host is Jason Todd, and we help faith-based founders tell the stories that matter on the Emissary Authors Podcast, and we will see you next time.